Hello fellow future enthusiasts. On Demystifying, we do deep dives on science, futurism, and speculative technology. My name is Thor, and I will be your host today. With the return to the moon on the horizon, and nuclear energy seeming more attractive now than ever, the nuclear systems we use on Luna may utilize nanostructures that have been developed in exclusively private science until very recently. Today we're looking at a technology that will fundamentally change how we build nuclear reactors, making them ultra-miniature, safe and transportable. To me, and I think to most people, the next generation of nuclear reactors will be indistinguishable from the magic of futuristic energy devices in science fiction. Humans can today build nuclear reactors which are made from common materials, are totally safe, are the size of a garbage can or smaller, have no moving parts, and have sanitized waste. We're far beyond the days of worrying about nuclear waste even from commercial fission plants. So, more importantly, we need a tech that will allow anyone to operate nuclear reactors with virtually no risk of them being misused for proliferation. Surlic mesh is a type of nano-heterostructure originating from experiments at Los Alamos mostly over the past decade based on over 70 years of research. The name refers to the material's design, a ceramic-coated bead of nuclear material suspended on an elastic metallic mesh immersed in a drain liquid. The point of this structure is to create a flexible material with the temperature range of a ceramic and the thermal conductivity of a metal. The type of material also determines modal resonance of the mesh, more on this later. Each nanobead emits a small neutron flux. As this neutron radiation passes through the drain liquid, it collides with other fission nanobeads and produces a localized fission interaction. When power is needed, the mesh is physically compressed, bringing the beads closer together. Compression of each bead's neutron flux provokes some of the nuclear material inside to go critical. This is when the Surlic mesh design begins to really shine. When criticality occurs, fission products have a limited distance they travel in a shotgun-like cone of focused radiation. This moment of peak energy is known as the Bragg peak and can travel a distance of around 15 microns in solid metals. Each nanobead is slightly less wide than the energy burst emanating from fission, so each blast of fission products bombarding the nanobead has enough energy to carry a shockwave into the drainage media surrounding the bead. This produces a cavitation-like response of the liquid metal drainage media, which pushes back into the fission site and captures fission products within a few hundred picoseconds. This keeps the fission products from shooting away as they normally would, remaining isolated in a high-energy pocket where the odds of their transmuting into a fuel element increases. Fission products continue to transmute until they are sufficiently light or heavy enough to float or sink in the drainage media, or become totally annihilated as fuel. Because of this design, waste products can be separated within the reactor and piped out directly in slurry. This capability allows for clever reactor designs which burn or breed material as it's produced, reducing the potential for such a system to be used as a tool for proliferation. So what is transmutation? Generally speaking, it is the process of one element becoming another after absorbing protons or neutrons. In our context, transmutation starts when an atom absorbs energy from a neutron. If a particle absorbs more energy during transmutation than it can get rid of during decay, it fissions. Understand that during transmutation, various elements have a probability of being produced, with gases being the most rare and light actinides such as neptunium being common. The materials used in the nanowire itself will also produce some non-radioactive byproducts through radiolysis. Simply put, the kinematics of the fission reaction separate waste products and allow them to undergo transmutation inside the ceramic bead. When atoms transmute, they emerge from the event with an amount of energy known as the recoil range. This allows elements with lower recoil ranges to remain trapped inside the bead and contribute to reactions, eventually becoming annihilated. This gets rid of most of the nasty elements we associate with nuclear waste. 
So we know Cyrillic mesh will produce much less radioactive waste solely because of its high fissile efficiency. This doesn't mean it's perfect though, quite a bit of light actinides will still be produced. So we have all kinds of waste coming out of the system, but in small amounts. Oxygen, nitrogen, iron, xenon, thorium, plutonium, etc. 100 grams per 100 megawatt day to be precise. We've made the claim that Cyrillic Mesh's waste will be easier to safely handle and harder to breed into weapons-grade material. This is quite a claim. How do we purport to make atoms less accessible for nefarious deeds? We exploit the law of masses, which says extracting from solution gets exponentially more difficult at lower concentrations. The 100 grams of waste is distributed in 100 liters of liquid metal. To properly get the radioactive particles out of solution would require engineering a nanomolecular membrane. Normally, ion extraction resins would be used to extract waste, but these are inefficient in collecting nanoparticle debris. The fewer needles in the haystack there are, the less likely you are to capture one. I don't want to oversell the Cyrillic mesh concept, but this stuff is so groundbreaking it's hard not getting excited. So let's allow the researchers who experimented with these systems speak for it. The new reactor concept has a strong impact on fuel cycle, because by continuously eliminating the fission products while maintaining the transmutation products, also called breeding products, inside the bead, and using gentle compression, it drives to a breed and burn scheme where most of the fertile uranium-238 is burned out, reducing the need for enrichment and drastically reducing the proliferation risks. Let's quickly take an aside to discuss the role of xenon in nuclear reactors. Xenon gas is produced in the process of nuclear transmutation and is known as a neutron poison. Xenon readily absorbs neutrons, and fission reactions require free neutrons to occur. A reactor will eventually choke on the xenon gas it produces unless steps are taken to remove it. Cyrillic mesh does not magically reduce xenon production, there's no way to do this we know of yet. What it does do is produce a peak of xenon gas early in the fission process, allowing transmutation interactions requiring high neutron flux to occur later. Basically, there's little xenon left by the time the generator is in power-on mode, because the coolant bath quickly removes xenon atoms from the beads. Xenon production always occurs when fission happens, but Cyrillic Mesh front-loads this and takes advantage of the thermal limits of the quantum realm. Recall that at the nanoscale, thermal and kinetic energy are indistinguishable from one another. Thermal energy in the wire will be transformed into electric potential, with each end of the wire acting as the anode and cathode. Exactly how conversion is done is fairly simple. We'll avoid technical discussion of things like neutron channels and keep it in simple terms for now. When an atom undergoes fission, it collapses, sending fission products flying at the fastest speed they can achieve. The fast-moving products strip some electrons from nearby atoms, and all of this produces an expanding cloud of neutrons, neutrinos, and gamma rays. This wave takes a few picoseconds to fully expand, leaving a vacuum behind. Inevitably, this causes an implosion, which sets electrons on the nanowire into oscillation. The oscillation frequency is referred to as the mesh's modal resonance. Once achieved, electric potential is produced. By design, the reactor only contains enough material to perform its role as a generator. This has benefits for proliferation, which is the security problem posed by access to nuclear material. Commercial products such as nuclear reactors can and have been used to produce weapons-grade nuclear material in the past. Today, this issue is hotly debated. On the topic of proliferation and the use of these reactors for producing weapons material, perhaps you could extract all of the material in one such reactor and misuse it. You could, but this is unreasonably difficult. Someone would have to strip the material off the wires and remove the ceramic molecules from each bead. Sure, you could do this, but if producing plutonium is your goal, there are much easier ways than trying to strip material off nanowires. Stealing fissile material from a Cyrillic mesh system requires the person doing so to have access to the same technology used to produce these systems. This makes them difficult to exploit by bad actors. Conditions inside the nanobead during operation are not yet very predictable. 
we rely on probability to determine the path of each stray neutron in the bead, a condition we describe as quark soup. Quantum interactions are difficult to scrutinize in this disordered soup, but if we are able to manipulate quantum states in the reactor environment, we could force only the neutron interactions we desire. This ability is entirely possible because the mechanisms involved are so small. They could be manipulated at the quantum level using known laboratory methods. A nuclear reactor where every single free neutron is guaranteed a pathway to the most efficient energy release? Yeah, we could actually do this in our lifetimes. It will be the next step for Sirlik Mesh and truly illustrates the unexplored potential of this domain of science. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Leave a comment with any questions or uh, statements you have. Leave a like and subscribe for more content like this.